Hello chemists, this is Ms. Placino and you are watching Screencast 12.1, an introduction to acids and bases. Today we're going to kick off the unit just kind of talking about some general properties of acids and bases and really focusing in on how to name acids. Uh, there's a special set of rules that we use. It's not all that difficult, but it is going to take some practice. Uh, so let's go ahead and get into today's lesson. Acids and bases are always aqueous solutions. Hopefully by now you know that when something is aqueous, that means that it is dissolved in water. Uh, for example, you're probably familiar with HCl. A lot of us know this as hydrochloric acid. Technically, as a pure substance, HCl is a gas, and we just call it hydrogen chloride. If we take that hydrogen chloride gas and we bubble it into some water, we will then produce hydrochloric acid. So we can represent that as HClAQ. So I know that's hydrochloric acid. And what makes hydrochloric acid actually acidic is that this compound is going to break apart or dissociate into ions. Uh, specifically, an acid is something that's going to produce H plus ions in solution. In future lessons, we'll talk a little bit more about definitions of acids and bases, but for the time being, we're going to go with the presence of H plus ions makes a substance acidic. Uh, so again, just as a pure substance, HCl is a gas, and we call it hydrogen chloride. Once you take that HCl and you dissolve it in water, you will ionize it uh, or break it apart, dissociate it, whatever you'd like to use to describe that process, and you're going to produce ions, more specifically H plus and Cl minus. Now, with H plus ions is what makes something an acid. Let's talk a little bit about properties of acids and bases. And this first picture over here, you might recognize this apparatus from a couple other points in time this school year. Um, hopefully you remember that this is referring to something being electrolytic. Because acids and bases are going to break apart into ions, they're going to be classified as electrolytic solutions. Um, hopefully you remember that electrolytic means able to conduct electricity, and that all stems from free uh, moving ions in solution. Acids and bases have different tastes. Please don't taste test things in the lab. That's never a good idea. Uh, bases taste bitter. You can match up the B and the B. And acids taste sour. If you're somebody who likes Sour Patch Kids or any type of sour candy, check the ingredient list. Um, I bet you're going to find something like citric acid present in those candies, and that's the same acid that's present in things like lemons and limes. They give those fruits and consequently those candies that sour taste. Um, leafy green vegetables tend to be, or tend to have some bases in them. For example, mustard greens, collard greens, dandelion greens. Uh, these are very bitter vegetables, and that's due to the presence of bases. Bases are very slippery. Um, soap is a good example of a base. It's easy to tell when you've got soap on your hands. Your hands feel slick. Um, so that's usually a sign that there's a base on your hands or on your skin and you need to wash it off. Acids, on the other hand, don't feel like anything. It just seems like you have water on your hands um, and usually you won't know there's an acid there until it starts to burn. So as always, you want to be careful with working uh, with acids and bases in the lab. Acids are corrosive to metals. Uh, basically what this means is acids are very reactive to most metals. Some people have the misconception that an acid can eat metal. Uh, chemicals don't really eat one another. They're not cannibalistic like that. Um, but basically, when an acid reacts with metals, it's going to liberate hydrogen gas. And often the remaining product, um, the uh, anion of the acid and then the metal itself are going to form an aqueous ionic compound. So you're not going to see it. So in effect, it does look like the metal is just disappearing, but that's obviously not the case. We can't destroy matter. You might recognize that paper as litmus paper. Bases turn litmus blue. Acids turn litmus red. Again, match up the B and the B to help you keep everything straight. Uh, technically, bases are tested using red litmus, and then it turns blue, the opposite for acids. Don't get too hung up on the details. Remember, bases turn litmus blue, and then acids are red. Um, match up the letters. And finally, the reaction between an acid and a base is called neutralization. We're going to be spending a lot of time later this unit talking about neutralization reactions. Um, but a neutralization reaction really isn't anything more than a very specific type of double replacement. 
The great thing about acid-base neutralizations is that they form the same two type of products every time. We're always going to make water, which is kind of nice. We don't have to figure out the formula. And then we're going to produce a salt. Uh, please take note that this is not necessary, uh, necessarily sodium chloride. It may be, but it does not have to be. It depends on the identity of the acid in the base. By salt here, we mean just ionic compound. So don't get that confused. It is possible for sodium chloride to be the product, um, but I know a lot of people when they think salt, their brain immediately jumps to NaCl, and not any combination of acid and base is going to produce sodium chloride. All right, just a little bit more about acids and bases. Uh, acids, we've already discussed it, they release H plus ions into solution. So when you think about an acid, you should associate the hydrogen ion. Uh, sometimes this is just going to be called a proton is released into solution. And if you think about it, most hydrogen atoms are just one proton and one electron. Uh, if we are a plus ion, that means we got rid of an electron, so that really just leaves us with a proton. So don't be confused by that, an H plus ion and a proton are one and the same. So when you put an acid in water, you'll of course have water molecules. There is going to be some hydroxides floating around, but the hydrogen ions are going to far outnumber your hydroxides, and that's going to make this an acidic solution. The ion you should associate with bases at this point in time is OH minus, the hydroxide ion. Um, Arrhenius bases, the bases that you learned about in middle school, we'll be talking more about them in the next lesson, release hydroxide ions into solution. So if we take a base and we dissolve it in water, we're going to still, of course, have our water molecules present. There will be some H plus ions, but they're going to be outnumbered by hydroxides. So we see a very low concentration of hydrogen ions and alternatively a very high concentration of hydroxide ions. And this is really the key to picking out whether something is acidic or basic. And that's going to be a big part of naming, which is what we're going to get into now. Good news, naming bases is exactly the same way that you would uh, name an ionic compound. So a lot of the bases that I ask you to name are going to contain an OH minus a hydroxide group. Uh, you want to name them the same way you learned how to name ionic compounds earlier this school year. So for example, if you have NaOH, we're going to call that sodium hydroxide. Hopefully nothing too difficult about that. CaOH in parentheses too. This is calcium hydroxide. Really, when you get down to it, most of your bases are going to have the anion hydroxide. Um, and then you just have to think about what the name is of the metal that's present. Remember, you have your reference table, so you're going to be able to look up the names. Also keep in mind that your transition metals, uh, metals that have multiple charges, you might need to include uh, the Roman numeral. Also remember that when you're talking about ionic compounds, we don't use prefixes like di or tri. For example, we wouldn't want to call this compound calcium dihydroxide. That is not a valid name. That's just simply calcium hydroxide. Naming acids is different. Or it's are different. Naming an acid really depends on what anion is present. If you think about it, every acid is going to have H plus as the cation. So the anion is going to determine how we name it. And anions really come in one of three different types. We have anions that end in ide. These tend to be monatomic. We have anions that end in eight. They tend to have lots of oxygen atoms present. And we have anubs, uh, sorry, ions that end in eight which tend to have fewer uh, oxygen atoms present than in the 8 version. So sulfate, for example, is FO4, uh, SO4 with a charge of 2 minus. Sulfite is SO3 with a charge of 2 minus. Uh, so let's talk about how to name these. Um, sometimes our, well, I should say often, our acids that have anions ending in ide are just simple binary acids. We've been talking about this one already. HCl, when it's dissolved in water, forms, hopefully you're thinking hydrochloric acid. We know before it's dissolved, it's just called hydrogen chloride. Anytime your anion ends in IDE, you drop the ide and you replace it with ic. So hydrogen chloride is going to go to chloric. 
we use the prefix hydro. Again, anytime our anion has the ending IDE. So this is why we call it hydrochloric acid. Hydro is the prefix, so it's always going to be used. We'll use the suffix ic, and we'll put the word acid at the end. This applies to all anions ending in ide. Most of them tend to be monatomic. If you go down group 17, you've got fluoride, chloride, bromide, iodide. Um, but there are some exceptions. Most notably, there is HCN, or uh, we'll get to the H part in just a second. There is CN minus. This is cyanide. And because this is a polyatomic, a lot of people name it incorrectly, even though it has the IDE. If we make HCN aqueous, we would call this hydro cyanic acid. You'd be amazed how many times I see people just write, you know, cyanic acid. That's not correct. Don't fall into that trap. Um, you know I'm going to put something like that on the test. Don't let me get to say, I told you so. Our oxy acids are the ones that have endings of eight and ite. Let's start off with our eights first. Before this compound is dissolved in water, it's called hydrogen sulfate. Once it is dissolved in water, it forms a strong acid, sulfuric acid. Uh, this is a little bit more confusing of an example because of this UR that got thrown in here. But our general rule is anions that end in eight have their suffix replaced with ic. Um, phosphoric, sulfuric acid, we've got these two extra letters thrown in there. Um, at this point in the game, if you call this sulfic acid, I'm pretty happy. You've shown me that you understand the rule, and just working with these compounds more frequently, you're going to get more comfortable and you'll get the names right. Um, there is a corny little mnemonic device that you can use to help you remember eights turn into X. We have an upset stomach. That's because I ate something icky at the cafeteria. Yeah, I know it's pretty bad and everybody rolls their eyes, but I promise uh, when you're going through and naming things, you're going to find yourself repeating these really cheesy mnemonic devices. Uh, so eights turn into ick. There are no extra prefixes that need to be added. All right, last but not least, we have oxy acids that don't have quite as many oxygens. So if we were just to name this as a pure substance, this would be hydrogen sulfites. We end in ite. However, once it's dissolved in water, we produce what's called sulfurous acid or sulfurous acid. Again, we have this kind of interesting thing going on with the UR getting shoved in there. But the general rule is if the anion ends in ite, I-T-E, replace it with a suffix us, O-U-S. Uh, just like with sulfur and phosphorus for the previous example, the letters U-R or O-R are going to be thrown in there. It just sounds better. But again, if you call this sulfous acid, I'm pretty content that you understand how to apply the rule, and we'll worry about having you sound like a chemist later. I have another mnemonic device for you. I didn't come up with this one. Students a number of years did. You'll be it if you come with us. I know it's probably horrible hearing me say that, but... Again, you'll find yourself saying it to help you name. All right, so that's the gist of it. We've got three new naming rules, and it's all about paying attention to the name of the anion present in the acid. If we end in ide, you need the prefix hydro and the suffix ic. So HBr, for example, is hydrobromic acid. If you have a compound that ends with, uh, I should say, an ion present in an acid that ends in eight, um, something like HNO3, that would be hydrogen nitrate. But when you dissolve it in water, you'll make nitric acid. Drop the eight, add ick. And finally, if you have compounds, um, I should say acids that are going to have an anion that ends in ites, we turn ites into uses. So HNO2, when dissolved in water, is not hydrogen nitrite, it's nitrous acid. Let's try some practice problems. Hmm, where did we go? Oh, here we are. 
All right. Um, so what I've done here is I've given you a whole bunch of different polyatomics, not just what's present on table E. Uh, for something like a quiz or a test, I'll either provide you with the name of the anion or I will make sure that it's on table E. What I'd like you to try to do is tackle questions 6 through 10. I'm going to walk through the first one with you. Uh, so this is a polyatomic I'm not familiar with, HiO3. I know this is an acid because we have these leading, uh, sorry, this leading H up front. Uh, so I need to find the IO3 minus ion. Mm, oh, sure enough, here it is. IO3 minus is called iodate. I ate something icky at the cafeteria. Eights turn into X. So I will call this iodic acid. Pause the video, try out questions 7 through 10 on your own, and heads up, 8 is a little tricky. All right, number 7 is called dichromic acid. I'm going to come back to number 8. Number 9 is hypochlorous, sorry, that's not very neat, acid. Uh, number 4, sorry, number 10 is phosphoric acid. Uh, number eight is kind of a, a classic New York State gotcha. If you take a look at this formula, to the untrained eye, this looks like it could be a base. That OH at the end looks really enticing to try to name this as a base. Good luck finding this uh, cation, CH3CO. That isn't really a thing. Um, sometimes in regions chemistry, people are really nice to you and they'll give you this instead. Most chemists don't really like the way that look. This tells me something about its structure. You'll understand more as we kind of progress through the remainder of this semester. Um, if I format it like this though, hopefully that gives away whether this is an acid or a base. This most certainly is an acid. More specifically, it is acetic acid. Acetic acid is the active ingredient in vinegar. And um, yeah, its formula, when written like this, does look like a base. Don't fall into that trap. Let's try a couple in the opposite direction. Let's go one through five. Most people feel like this is a little bit easier than having to come up with a name. So I've got hydrofluoric acid. Okay, hydrofluoric, that tells me that this was an IDE ending anion. Uh, so I think that's going to be the fluoride anion, which is just F minus. Uh, so this is hydrofluoric acid. That must be HF. Pause the video. See if you can take care of questions two through five. All right. Oxalic acid. That must come from oxalate, and that's an ion you are most likely unfamiliar with, but it shows up on that table that I provided you. Um, so oxalate is C2O4 with a charge of 2 minus, therefore oxalic acid must be H2C2O4. Hydrosalinic acid, again that prefix hydro tells me I'm most likely looking at a monatomic anion. And indeed I am, this is H2SE. Carbonic acid, no prefix hydro, that must mean that this was an 8. Oh, so it's the carbonate ion, which is CO3 2 minus, so H2, CO3. And finally, chlorous acid. Um, OUS means it must have ended in ite. Uh, so I've got the chlorite ion. So I have H, ooh, don't need that, HClO. Okay. Um, so, oh, sorry, HClO2, my mistake. All right, that wraps it up for today. Um, naming acids really just takes practice. Remember, naming bases is exactly the same way you learned it many, many months ago when we were talking about naming ionic compounds. Um, that's all I've got for today. I hope you found this screencast helpful, and thanks for tuning in.